Well, welcome everybody to this event on tackling cyber disinformation in elections, applying international human rights law. I'm Harriet Moynihan. I'm an associate fellow here in the International Law Program at Chatham House. Uh, and it's my pleasure tonight to moderate this discussion and to introduce you to the fantastic panel that we have here, who happen to be all female, but that was a coincidence, I assure you. Um, cyber operations are increasingly used by political parties, political consultancies, and foreign states to influence electorates, from algorithms promoting specific messages to micro-targeting based on personal data, often without people being aware that it's their personal data that's being used, and the creation of filter bubbles and echo chambers. The risks of digital tools spreading disinformation and polarizing debate is well known and has been highlighted by, for example, the UK's Brexit referendum uh, and also the 2016 US presidential election, as well as many elections around the world. While some governments are adopting legislation to tackle these issues, for example, Germany's net DG law, and France's law against the manipulation of information, other, gov other governments have been proposing an independent regulator. For example, the UK, which has a white paper out on uh, the idea of an online harms regulator. Meanwhile, the digital platforms, as the curators of content themselves, are under increasing pressure to take their own measures to tackle data mining and disinformation. The key for tonight is how do international human rights standards, for example, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, and the right to privacy, guide the use of digital technology in the context of elections? What practical steps can governments and digital platforms themselves take to ensure that policies, laws, and, and practices are in line with the fundamental standards of human rights? And with the general election around the corner here in the UK, can these steps come about soon enough? I'd like to introduce our panel here tonight. I'm delighted to start with Kate Jones, who is the director of the Diplomatic Studies course at the University of Oxford. Kate also used to work for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and uh, worked at a high level on human rights issues in London, Strasbourg, and Geneva. And most importantly, Kate is the author of a paper that's been published here in Chatham House today on uh, on the very topic we're discussing, tackling di cyber disinformation in elections. And I think there are some hard copies around the room, so please do, do take one. And I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot more about the paper to tonight. Um, Susie Allegre on my left here is an um, international human rights law barrister at Doughty Street Chambers. She's also adjunct associate fellow at Trinity College Dublin and a research fellow at Roehampton University. Susie, ha Susie has recently written an article on the way that technology can interfere with our freedom of thought and the potential impact of that uh, on us as individuals and on democratic societies. Turning now to my right, Evelyn Aswad, who's a very well-known and respected academic in the field of international human rights. She's professor of law and Herman G. Kaiser chair of international law at the University of Oklahoma. And as well as being an academic, Evelyn has also served as Director of Human Rights in the Legal Bureau at the U.S. State Department under a previous administration and as Legal Advisor for U.S. Delegations in various international fora at the U.N. And finally, Barbara Bukowska, Senior Director of Law and Policy at Article 19, an NGO, as you I'm sure you know, which is heavily involved in these issues, particularly in the context of freedom of expression. So that's our panel. The event is going to last until 7. The first half will be taken up with me asking questions to the panel. And the second half will give you, the audience, an opportunity to ask questions of them yourself. Um, we are uh, on record tonight. It's, um, it's a live event as well that's being um, live streamed through the Chatham House website. We better all behave ourselves. Um, and a few housekeeping points before we start. If you'd like to tweet about the event, please do. There's a Twitter handle, which is hashtag CHEvents. Um, there's a reception afterwards upstairs, so please continue the conversation with us um, over a drink uh, when it finishes. And finally, if you do have phones, if you could just put them on silent. Thank you. So I'd like to start the panel conversation by asking Kate about her paper, which considers how to apply an international human rights law framework to disinformation and political discourse. 
Kate, can you just set the scene for us by just telling us in general terms what role you think international human rights law can play in the context of disinformation and elections? So thank you, Harriet, and it's a pleasure to be here. So we're all aware that political campaigning has changed radically in the last few years and that now far more of it is done online. But at the moment, we find it hard to know where the legitimate boundaries of that should be online. We don't yet have a compass to assess what's legitimate and what ought to be controlled. So for example, when Twitter says that they will ban political advertising and Facebook responds saying that they won't, we find it difficult to know who's right. I think if we imagine political discourse as, uh, as if it were a game that's played on a pitch with boundaries and rules, suddenly a few years ago, part of it jumped onto a new pitch in the virtual world. For a while, there seemed to be a culture that because having a new pitch is a good thing, in that it gave access to a lot more voices uh, to take part a lot more freely, um, therefore, all that it offers is good, and therefore, it should be somewhere that the game should be played without rules. But I think we're now maturing from that perspective, um, and it is clearly time for there to be new rules on political campaigning and political discourse online. So the question then is who should be devising the rules, whether it should be states, whether it should be the digital platforms or others, and what they ought to look like. And there's often an impression that we're starting with a blank sheet of paper. So for example, as to whether political advertising should be banned, whether deliberate disinformation ought to be restricted, whether Twitter should no longer be anonymous, whether WhatsApp groups should be limited in their reach. But actually, I think that is where human rights law comes in. So that is where I would answer your question, Harriet. We already have this very carefully developed, carefully applied international normative framework to guide us in developing the rules. It's the same framework that we had on the old pitch, and we should be thinking about how to apply it to the new one, both at the international level and also domestically as well. So human rights law is the compass that should be guiding our assessment of legitimate and illegitimate behavior. All businesses have a responsibility to respect the human rights of individuals, and all governments have a duty to protect human rights. So this means that governments have a duty to regulate where that's necessary. Governments must uphold freedom of expression, but they must uphold other rights as well at the same time. But somehow, human rights law has largely been overlooked in this debate to date, I think. And that's what we're trying to change um, this evening. Um, my research found that none of the human rights I looked at are really being fully respected in the online environment at the moment. So we're going to discuss that in detail, but just to give a couple of very quick examples. Everyone has a right to privacy. That means that we should have a right, a real right, not just a notional right, to choose whether or not political parties, political campaigners and others should be able to develop very, very detailed profiles about us and use them to target advertising on us. Secondly, everyone has a right to participate in public affairs. So that means just at the most basic level, if there are members of parliament who are saying that they have to quit because of the abuse and the threats that they're facing online, that suggests that we're not upholding that right to participate very well. And thirdly, um, as Susie is going to talk about, everyone has a right to freedom of thought and opinion. Um, and we need to think about what that entails when we hear about the risks of social media's Ill illegitimate manipulation of our thoughts and emotions without us knowing that that's happening. Thanks, Kate. Yes, and your paper talks about a number of different rights, as you say, freedom of expression, the right to privacy, the right to vote, but also the rights to freedom of thought and freedom of opinion. And those are rights that haven't had much airtime in this debate to date. And Susie, I'd be very interested if you could tell us a bit more about them and how they are relevant in this context. Absolutely. Well, I think free, the rights to freedom of thought and freedom of opinion, as you said, have been largely overlooked. But in my view, they're really fundamental questions that underpin the questions we're going to talk about in relation to all the other rights. 
Um, freedom of thought and freedom of opinion in international human rights law are dealt with quite separately. So freedom of thought is generally um, joined up with freedom of belief, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, while freedom of opinion is put with freedom of expression. Um, and I think that also highlights how crucial they are to very different parts of the rights framework and to what it means to be human. But I think the distinction between them is actually quite difficult to identify. What both talk about are the rights effectively to think or form opinions in the privacy of my own mind. So what goes on inside my head before I start telling you uh, what I'm thinking is what's ultimately protected um, as the forum internum under the right to freedom of thought and the right to freedom of opinion. And where those two rights differ to many of the other rights we're going to talk about today is that they are absolute rights. So what that means is that if a, a, a government or a practice interferes with my absolute right to think for myself inside my head, then that can never be justified. So unlike where interference is with the right to privacy, you can have a long list of justifications uh, that the regulator then has to decide whether or not um, those are valid. With the right to freedom of thought or freedom of opinion, if you're getting inside my head, you're not allowed to. That's the, the bottom line. There are rights that have largely been ignored, um, as Harriet and Kate have mentioned. And one of the reasons seems to be that certainly in the 20th century, commentators said, well, of course these rights are absolute, but that goes without saying, because nobody can get inside my head and change the way I think or understand what I'm thinking unless I tell them. <coughs> And while I'm not sure that that was really a valid argument even in the 20th century, I think now it's fairly clear that in many areas, including in the democratic space, that is not something we can afford to rely on any longer. The issue that made me start to think about the right to freedom of thought and freedom of opinion was when I first read about Cambridge Analytica in late 2016. And when I was reading a story, and it was all about data protection and privacy, but I thought, no, actually, what we're talking about with behavioral micro-targeting is my right to freedom of thought. Because essentially, um, what it's doing is going, or, or trying to go inside my head, understand how I think, and then trying to go back in and manipulate how I behave uh, politically. And the right to freedom of thought um, and similarly, freedom of opinion, have three key planks. The first one is that I have the right to keep my thoughts private. No one can coerce me to reveal what I'm thinking. The second is a, a right to be free from manipulation of my thoughts. And the third is the right not to be penalized for my thoughts. And those three planks give this absolute protection. And what behavioral micro-targeting does is effectively start by interfering with the right to keep thoughts private by taking a wide range of behavioral data about me to try and understand my personality and what I'm thinking in ways that I don't even know that I am giving away, and then to come back in and use that information to press buttons that will affect the way I think uh, and behave. And that model is essentially a, a, a commercial model uh, that uh, the writer Shoshana Zuboff has identified as surveillance capitalism, but it's now being used very much in the political uh, sphere. What I found interesting, just to finish off in the UK context, is that while we've seen a lot of outrage about Cambridge Analytica becoming this huge scandal, inquiries, um, stories about data breaches and electoral spending, while all of this was going on, the parliament passed the Data Protection Act with an exemption for political parties on political opinion. And what that means is that if you look at most of the main political parties' uh, privacy policies, they will explicitly tell you that they're effectively gathering as much data as they can on you from any source uh, that they can in order to profile you and target you uh, based on your political opinions. And that this is OK because the law says it's OK. Interestingly, Spain followed the UK's lead, because clearly for political parties, this is a great idea. You can get all this information, and you can target the electorate. 
But in Spain, the Defensor del Pueblo took a case to the Spanish Constitutional Court, claiming that the Spanish provision was a, a breach of the Constitution, both on privacy grounds, but also on ideological freedom grounds, which is the Spanish constitutional equivalent of freedom of thought and opinion. So while the court didn't find on that ground, they found that it was unconstitutional on privacy grounds, they did discuss this idea of ideological freedom. And I think that's very interesting because I think it starts to open up the debate to look at how we can use freedom of thought and opinion yeah. to control these practices. That's a really good concrete example of seeing it you know, coming to the surface. I suppose one of the difficulties is it's very hard to track what, what's being targeted at whom. Mm -hmm. So yes, I can see the theoretical framework is there, but in practice, um, if there are posts saying you know, five million people are coming over from Turkey and they're coming to you, yeah. it, it's very hard to know who received that. And um, th that's because that's gone to their personal Facebook account or whatever, and there's no inventory of that. Yeah. Um, Evelyn, I'd be very interested to sort of think about the value of international human rights law in the context of content moderation. Uh, we've talked a lot about the disinformation in, in the sort of intro to this event, but obviously there's also issues like hate speech, which also play into a sort of political discourse. Can you just uh, give us some thoughts on that? Uh, sure, and uh, thank you to Chasm Health for hosting this important meeting, and kudos to Kate for an incredible, superb paper that I believe will be a game changer on this topic, so bravo, Kate. Um, yes, uh, in, in 2018, the UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression called on social media companies to align their content moderation with the international standard for free speech, which is Article 19 of the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. <coughs> And essentially, what he's asking uh, the social media companies to do is to run their content moderation rules through the three-part test of Article 19. So the first part of that would be, are the rules, uh, do they meet the legality test? Which means, um, among other things, are they vague? Do they give uh, sufficient notice to users? Do they give sufficient notice to their uh, employees who are implementing those laws? Or do they allow for undue discretion? So that's a, a first way of reining in and bringing uh, some principled analysis to these, these private speech codes. The second test that they need to run their speech codes through is known as the necessity test, which means, among other things, that uh, any restraint they put on speech must be the least intrusive infringement on speech. And I've proposed in my scholarship that this means a, a three-pronged test that the companies need to think about. And this test was recently endorsed by the special rapporteur in his October report to the General Assembly. So what I've argued is that social media companies need to first analyze whether there are good governance measures they can engage in that solve this public interest problem without restricting speech. Examples of this could include, are they engaging and promoting and funding digital and media literacy to the extent possible? Are there angles to their own business models that promote this offensive speech, such as algorithms that promote you know, offensive speech, um, micro-targeting that might target speech at particularly susceptible people? They need to look at their own governance uh, in this prong. If that's not sufficient, then they would look at their continuum of options to restrict speech. And they have more options even than governments, right? They can knock a user off their platform, they can knock content off their platform. They can geo-block content from their platform. They can temporarily block content on their platform. They can demote content in their algorithms. Um, they've got a lot of, of options. Uh, they can add friction. They can put warnings uh, before a user sees certain content. So there's a lot of uh, options there, and they need to prove that they're choosing the least restrictive means. Lastly, they need to also monitor that the means selected actually achieves its intended purpose, right? If it's counterproductive, if it's ineffective, they really can't legitimize restricting speech in that fashion. The third part of the ICCPR three-part test is that the restriction needs to be imposed for a public interest rationale, public health, public order, et cetera. So these companies need to be making a case that there is a reason for restricting speech beyond revenue generating content brand management purposes. Um, and putting them through this rigorous exercise is a way of bringing some principled, uh, global, globally accepted standards uh, to the companies. I would just make maybe one uh, additional note that, of course, uh, 
respect for the UN guiding principles on business and human rights requires all of these companies to be engaging in human rights due diligence before they issue policies such as the ads policies that Kate um, was mentioning. They need to be reaching out to external stakeholders, having discussions about how human rights can be impacted. And um, that's also part of bringing a human rights lens is the process by which they adopt these policies. Thank you. And I should have said at the beginning that Article 19 is Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, for those who aren't lawyers out there, which deals with freedom of expression. We have our Article 19 expert over there. Um, Evelyn, it sounds good in principle. Um, may I just ask about the practical uh, Im implications? So to what extent are the digital platforms actually taking on board what, what you've said and what the UN have recommended? Yeah, um, so I, I think I agree overall with uh, what the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression has said in his October report to the General Assembly, which is that unfortunately, uh, these companies have generally avoided applying human rights law um, to their operations, um, avoided living up to the standards. Uh, this is you know, very distressing for many of us in this field, and, and Kate points out all the reasons why it is a problem in her report. Um, there are some small um, reasons for hope, I think, that I wanted to point out, though, that maybe they're inching in this uh, regard and um, toward this goal. And that's, for example, Twitter hired um, Human Rights Watch's digital rights advocate, right, in-house. In uh, Facebook has hired some of the most high-profile privacy right experts from the United States in-house. So it gives us some hope that they perhaps they are trying to focus more on human rights and trying to do more. Of course, these are enormous organizations and it will take some time. Um, I'm happy to talk about it later if we end up discussing Facebook's oversight board. Yeah. But Facebook's uh, launch of that board had uh, three important references to international human rights standards, which could be a, a hook for bringing that body of law um, into content moderation. Um, but as I was saying previously, in the day-to-day -day announcements of policies adopted by companies, we have yet to see the, uh, the process that's required by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights of those human rights due diligence, the human rights impact assessments, the bringing together of stakeholders. We are having these very important discussions on Twitter. Mm. We are having people complain about these policies on Twitter, at most publishing an op-ed piece, and we need to do it in a much more systemic way. Um, as Professor Klonick in the US has pointed out, these are our new governors. And you know, Kate and I have both worked in the government, and we know before launching a new policy, there are notice and comment periods. There's discussion with external stakeholders. Uh, making policy by tweets is not, is not a great way to go. So I hope part of our discussion tonight also encourages people to not just criticize the substantive policies, criticize the, poli the process that they're engaging, or the lack of process as well. Thank you. It's good to hear there are some glimmers of hope there. Um, Barbara, obviously freedom of expression is a big part of this conversation. Um, if we're looking at disinformation, the spread of information to cause harm, often un un untrue information. Um, is, it, is it not right that the right to freedom of expression is not absolute, and that we need to consider the extent to which there should be limits on freedom of expression in some contexts? Well, indeed, and uh, it's, uh, I, I'm from freedom of expression organization, and we get this question often, but uh, indeed, freedom of expression is not an absolute right. It can be restricted. However, the international law standards create the conditions and very limited circumstances under which this right can be restricted, and none of this restriction is based on the falsity or truth of information. And we don't need to really go far for finding out what the standards for restriction is, because Evelyn already highlighted it. It's uh, this three-part test, which she, she mentioned. Uh, the restrictions need to be based on the law. They need to pursue a specific legitimate interest, which is actually specifically enumerated in the Article 19, paragraph 3 of ICCPR, which says it's uh, restrictions on basis on the national security, public order, public health uh, and morals, and rights and uh, reputation of the others. But also, these restrictions need to be effective. They need to be proportionate to these uh, aims pursued. And they need to be necessary in the democratic society. So this last part of the test is often lost in these discussions, because the focus is by the states when they are adopting, coming with the new legislations to restrict uh, the, and criminalize the falsity of information, either online or offline, or putting a liability on the companies for failure to remove this false information.
So we always uh, highlight the need to look at whether the restrictions will really re uh, lead to desirable effect of less spread of disinformation, but also whether it's really necessary. And when we look at the studies which look at the, the let's say, impact of the misinformation online, it shows that the reach is large. However, its impact is far lesser than what is uh, commonly thought. And even if the picture which is painted by this study is rather incomplete and calls for additional research, the public debate on this regulation should really go beyond the buzzwords on falsity, misinformation, and disinformation. So just some examples from this study is the research of uh, Oxford University Reuters Institute on Study of Journalism actually showed that in, let's say, in France and Italy, the, the false news or disinformation sites uh, individually reached most of 3.5% 3, 3 of the population and the total time spent on these sites each month was much lower than the time spent on the news website. And they also find out that overall the available, available evidence shows that the false news and misinformation has much less limited reach than it's sometimes uh, misused. And they actually, some, some commentators even said that what we know so far about the impact of misinformation can be summarized as that there is a certain types of misinformation which is uh, on certain subjects transmitted towards certain types of person with certain types of circumstances which has certain types of effects. So not, not very much. But uh, the, um, the, the conclusion from is that our current knowledge of the situation is far less um, comprehensive that what warrant strong policy interventions based on falsity of information. But my second point on this topic is that what actually is this discussion of the disinformation is misinformation is hiding is actually much deeper and more complex issues, such as some of them highlighted in Kate's study, such as the business model of these companies, which is extremely problematic from human rights perspective and also from the harm to society and economy. And also the second part of the right to freedom of expression, which is that the states have obligation to ensure pluralism and diversity of the information. So there is a positive obligation of the state to enable the pluralism and diversity of information. And the question is, how do, you, how do, we, how do we do this uh, online? Because online there is much more information, but the distribution systems are uh, less, um, less conducive to finding the information. And actually, it's quite clear that the business model of the, this uh, dominant companies, and actually this is also one uh, very important point, that when we talk about the digital companies, we really need to focus on those which are dominant on the market. So we should not lump Facebook, Twitter, Google, together with, let's say, Mumsnet or some you know, LinkedIn, which is uh, for totally different purposes. And they really need to look at the, those which are dominant and dominate the market and also um, distribution of the information. But looking at their business model, the business model is actually not conducive to diversity and pluralism of um, information at all. It's based on advertising, which is set on a very complex um, conduct, and then on data collection, which then allows the marketing and personalization of the targeted advertising. And for what concerns us as, as individuals, but also as a free speech organization, is that uh, users do not get access to content which is potentially available online on the platform, but only tiny portion, which will keep them engaged, which will uh, be able to monetize their attention. And in other words, these platforms do not really have business incentive to, uh, to, to show pluralism and diversity of content online. So when we look at the solution to this, uh, to this problem, we need to come with, uh, of course, a human rights solution to content moderation. But the other one is also how we force these companies through you know, business interventions such as you know, competition rules or even forcing them to open their protocol to other competitors and providing users with more diverse information rather than the ones which is curated by them. Mm. Yes, thanks, Barbara, because I was actually going to come on to the issue just, you, you just raised about the use of our personal data, which is being collected and traded and used widely, often in algorithmic processes that we're not even aware of ourselves. Um, and Kate, your, uh, your piece talks a lot about the right to privacy and the fact that, that users have very little choice. Um, often it's very hard even to opt out, or even if you opt out of cookies, you can't have full access to a site. 
to what extent do you think the existing pr practices with relation to sort of personal data are consistent with international human rights law, in particular the right to privacy? Um, thank you, Harriet. And before I answer that, perhaps just to pick up on one or two things from all of the really excellent sure. points, if I may, yeah, just really quickly that Evelyn yeah. and Barbara made. I think the first is that we don't necessarily have to accept the world as it is and then say, oh, this breaches human rights, that doesn't breach human rights, and, and so on. I think another point that the special rapporteur has also made um, is about human rights by design. You know, and when we're thinking about the design of systems and when platforms are thinking about the design of systems, there should be human rights assessments built in, which very much feeds in then with the points that, that Barbara was, was making just now. Um, and I also think that governments can't abdicate their responsibility for the public interest to the digital platforms on this. The digital platforms have had to do a lot of decision making. They've had to try to work out how to moderate content and so on. And clearly, they, some of them have the resources to do that. But ultimately, it's for governments to work out what the public interest is and how that's best served. Um, and for the reasons that, that Barbara's given, even if if platforms have human rights lawyers built in, in within them and so on, they still uh, have commercial incentives going in other directions, which makes it very difficult for them to take on that role, which ought to lie with, with government. So I think there's a real responsibility there, both at the international level and then domestically as well. On the data side, and Susie has touched on this um, already, um, we do, of course, have a, very, a regime of very careful control of personal data, and we have the GDPR in Europe, we have the Data Protection Act here. Um, but as Susie has touched on, I think, what that allows um, is really very broad in terms of collection of our, and use of our personal data in the political context. If you look at the privacy policies of the political parties, and I, I've got one of them here, um, they're very explicit um, in what they do, and indeed they're acting in accordance with the law. I'm not suggesting that they're doing anything that, that isn't lawful, and that they will gather information about you, not just from the electoral roll, but from, for example, um, information that they might buy about you, about, say, your uses of credit cards, or about your use online, so what media sites you're reading, what newspapers you choose uh, to read, um, what... Um, you, what you might be looking up about your health conditions or about relations, all sorts of things to build up quite a detail, a very detailed profile of you. And then they can uh, target their advertising according to that profile. So they can offer very, very different adverts to one person to another person. And then if they discover um, that actually the targeted adverts they're sending out aren't working, that they're not being read or liked or shared, they can tweak those and change them. So political campaigning has become very different just in the last few years. It's really different from the time when you just used to receive things through the letterbox uh, and um, political parties didn't know that much about you. And as I say, it's all lawful at the moment, but the question is whether it should be and whether, whether that's really compatible with a right to privacy. We are all giving up on a sort of daily basis every time we're consenting to cookies, every time we are, we're, we're doing those things. We're giving up little bits of ourselves as the price of access to websites, as the price of what we do on our phones all the time. And is it really right that we should be giving up so much of that? Is that really consistent with the, the right to privacy? Um, and I think that's, those are the kind of questions that we needs to be asking ourselves. And then that's even before you get to unlawful activity. And of course, there have been some awful scandals like Cambridge Analytica scandal, or like, for example, the information commissioner has, has issued fines to websites designed for new mums, both Emma's Diary and Bounty, for their um, uh, sale of data on millions of people um, which, uh, w without their consent. Um, and of course, the bigger question that underlies all of this is that with data being so enormously valuable, and of course that's what's making the large digital platforms some of the most valuable com companies in the world, should we all be giving it away so freely? Or actually, should the system be, be changed um, so that, um, for example, should the value of your personal data be, sh be shared with you rather than just collected? I think there are really big questions there that could be talked about, and the right to privacy gives us a lens <laughs> to begin talking about 
um, about those questions. I'm not saying that data collection is wrong. There are lots of fantastic advantages in data collection too, but I think we really need to be having a conversation about what the right to privacy actually entails in this context and whether with the best will in the world, we've actually moved a long way away from it. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Kate, and, and the lack of transparency around it yes. with many people yeah. not actually realizing what's being held on yes, them and with what purpose. Mm. Um, Susie, I'm also thinking about the fact that these rights don't exist in silo. Then they actually do interact with each other. And Kate's points about the use of personal data feed into the right to freedom of thought and opinion. Can you just elucidate that a bit for us? Yeah, absolutely. And I think in the report, um, Kate really highlights the freedom of thought and opinion angles and how that works um, with big data. And I think just picking up on what you've said, I think what's very interesting is that you regularly hear people saying that whatever they're doing is lawful. But I do think that there are opportunities to challenge that, both in the UK and elsewhere. Because in the UK, for example, um, we have the Human Rights Act, as I mentioned, in Spain, they use the Constitution to challenge the legislation around uh, political parties. And in many countries, there are those kind of opportunities. And I think it will be through the courts that we will find out where that line is between legitimate and illegitimate influence, and where that line is about how our data can be used to manipulate us. Um, and I think that that is the important question as well. And as you mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to know whether or not you've been targeted, whether or not you've been manipulated, what the outcome is. And again, going back to the Cambridge Analytica scandal, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not it worked, or whether or not it was just snake oil. Um, and I think that again misses the point. The point is that the intention is to understand how people's minds work on an individual level and to manipulate them accordingly. And that practice or that attempt should not uh, be lawful in my view. So I think that there are real opportunities to scope out how data protection interfaces with the right to freedom of thought and opinion. And as I said earlier, the fact that those rights are absolute, I think even if you fail in court, you'll at least start to understand where those boundaries are and what's permissible and what's not under international human rights law. Thank you. Just turning the conversation towards solutions, um, we've, we've heard a bit about what some governments are doing in terms of coming out with laws. Um, we've heard a bit about what some of the digital platforms are doing in terms of self-regulation, and it'll be interesting to hear your views on those in a minute. Um, but there have also been some proposals on independent regulators, um, for example, at the Facebook's um, oversight board and also the idea of a, a UK's idea of an online harms regulator. And Barbara, I wondered if you had any thoughts on independent regulation and any other, any other ideas that have been put out there for tackling this? Yes, indeed. And thank you for outlining some of these uh, proposals. So in UK, the online harms paper proposed to establish the of, of web as a regulator of the online companies. And then in uh, Facebook recently launched its oversight body, which will be sort of appeal court uh, its ambition is an appeal court for Facebook content moderation decisions. So from Article 19 perspective, both of these models have a problem. One is that uh, under international standards, it should be least restrictive intervention into the, the right. And the state regulation is not the least intervention unless self-regulation has failed. However, the self-regulation is also problematic because of lack of transparency and accountability and also a total control by the company. So what we proposed instead is the, to take an uh, example from example of press councils or press regulatory bodies, which have been set up not necessarily just by the industry alone, although in some countries they are only set by the industry, but by the stakeholders' involvement. So this would be uh, the institutions that would have been created through open and consultative process and that would have much broader participation of those who will be making decisions uh, on those um, issues. The issues which also we propose the social media councils, uh, although the term might not be the social media councils, it might be something, something else, but multi-stakeholder councils are not uh, very, uh, very popular sort of terminology. But they would look at the community guidelines of the companies and they would make sure that they are uh, clear and also in line with international human rights standards, which often is not the case. But also they would have a uh, role in reviewing decisions of the companies. 
that they make on the content. It will be obviously very difficult if they were making decisions about whether to remove this post or whether to remove this um, you know, video, uh, but they could provide the guidance on issues such as removal of the groups or removal of certain individuals. So there was a lot of hype recently in, let's say, Italy, which removed two uh, political parties for being um, a violate, for a violation of the community guidelines uh, from Facebook because they were propagating some violence against minorities, or in US they removed certain high profile individuals such as Louis Farrakhan or Anthony Jones. And, but there are many examples from other countries where actually individuals have been convicted for incitement to hatred and they have been even you know, kicked from the parliament, such as you know, for example in Slovakia, but Facebook would not find the content which was even found criminal by the courts in violation of their community guidelines. So the social media councils could provide useful guidance to the companies on this and also some um, recourse to the, to the users. But the second part of our solution is uh, to look beyond the content moderation issues. And I touched on that in my original remarks. So for example, issues such as um, allowing more pluralism on the platforms, either through you know, settings, so on default, uh, there could be a different default setting set up by the companies, but also opening the IPI protocol to, for moderating on your platform to competitors. So this is uh, not something you know, which we just dream um, out of blue, but this is also a well, uh, well um, used model from telecommunication industry, or for example, from banking industry, from unbundling certain services or vertical separation of the certain services. And from the pluralism and diversity, this would be actually quite useful because the studies show that not all the users are diversity averse, they actually value diversity. So if this um, competition was open on the platform, this could also provide incentives to other platforms that are having a pluralism and diversity within their, their uh, objectives. But also importantly, look at the issue of the of the market barriers which this business model creates, such as uh, the dominant, dominance of the platform. So look at the issue from the competition perspective, not just from the content moderation perspective, because the content moderation is just one part of the problem, which will not solve the, all these underlying issues uh, that we see as problematic. Thank you, Barbara. Well, I think we've had a lot of food for thought. <coughs> And I'd now like to open it up to you to hear your views, um, your comments and your questions. In particular, you know, whether you think Kate's right that there should be new rules of the game and that international human rights law should play a part in those rules. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, if you could put up your hand and we have microphones roving around the room. Um, and if you could start by just saying your name and affiliation before you ask the question, that would be very helpful. Um, I'll start with the gentleman at the back over there, please. Frederick Most at the Digital Scholarship Institute. I'd like to pick up on your point, uh, specifically, uh, Harriet, on solutions. So governments are starting to regulate furiously around the world, and obviously they need to protect their citizens. But my big concern is the global stage because the internet and the web is global by definition. International human rights is global. And if we fragment these, these particular solutions, that would cause in itself an enormous problem. Um, and my question is, on the solution front, at a practical level, to implement international due, due process, digital due process, is how to do this. So the obvious answer would be the United Nations, but the UN Secretary General's high-level panel uh, the results didn't seem to create that infrastructure or architecture on a global basis. And I'd love to hear from the panelists how they think we can harmonize these crucial issues on digital due process globally. Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, Kate, as the author of the paper, may I give you the floor? Sure. Yeah, it is absolutely a really good question because, as you say, the Internet doesn't know jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, and it's definitely a, a challenge that we're facing at the moment. As you say, there was the Secretary General's high-level panel report a few months ago, which did call for uh, everyone to look at human rights in this space, um, which is a great step forward, I think. And following that, the Human Rights Council passed a resolution mandating its advisory committee to work on this. So there is a process that has begun uh, at the Human Rights 
level of the Human Rights Council, which is really good. And at the same time, some of the UN Special Rapporteurs are also working on this, particularly David Kay, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Opinion, whose work Evelyn talked about in detail. And there's also now a Special Rapporteur on the Right to Privacy as well. Um, but none of that has got very far yet, and I get the sense that there is no international consensus whatsoever on these issues, and that, that's very difficult. Um, so governments do need to work more on this, I think, to try to generate more international consensus. I think what's interesting as well is that sometimes regional initiatives can then catch on and have a broader, broader effect. So, for example, the EU's general data protection regulation um, was quite pioneering in how far it went in data protection. And what you've seen since then is some other jurisdictions looking to follow that model. Particularly in the US, California has passed quite a similar law which is coming into force at the beginning of next year. Um, and there's been discussion about wider regulation though that hasn't really got anywhere yet. So I think if a region of the world starts to take an initiative, then other parts of the world can follow suit as well. I don't know if, if others... Yeah, Susie, yeah. maybe you want to add something. Yeah, maybe just to follow up. I mean, I think I, I worked earlier this year on a, a campaign against disinformation in the European Parliament elections which really flagged precisely the problem that you're talking about. And I think on a European level, given that we do have European parliamentary elections, there should be an opportunity, at least on a European level, uh, to look at that kind of coordination and how you deal with online campaigning. Because at the moment, it is totally piecemeal and with very different interests in very different countries uh, being reflected in their legislation. So I think Europe seems to be the obvious starting point. Yeah. Evelyn, did yeah. you want to? Um, I think I would just add, uh, and this comes from nine years of negotiating human, uh, human rights issues at the United Nations, that I think it's going to be very difficult to have a UN approach on this because many countries are using the fact that there is an internet and digital rights to promote an agenda of redoing, uh, revising, renegotiating human rights standards. So in 2011, when the Human Rights Council passed a resolution that human rights apply online as they apply, uh, apply as they do offline, you know, when I sh share that with my students, they're like, that's so obvious. Why did you guys get together to do that, right? <laughs> it was really, really hard. Tons of work and diplomacy went into getting that acknowledgement because many players mm -hmm. wanted to undermine the whole regime. And if you read the Freedom House report, which was released, I think, yesterday on the state of how nation states are reacting to um, their citizens trying to speak <coughs> online, trying to have privacy online. It's not very um, optimistic, the report. So I don't think those state actors at the UN will be able to help bring that approach that you're looking for. While uh, I think various nations can adopt good legislation that become uh, a standard others follow, and perhaps regionally, there's also the risk of the opposite happening, right? We see a lot of countries adopting bad legislation, and then that becomes you know, something others follow. So we really need to watch everything happening on multiple levels, I think, internationally, regionally, and domestically during this very important, I think, liminal moment in where uh, the human rights approach will go. Yeah. Barbara. Just, just a, sh a short comment since you said the digital due process and the rules around it. So I think that we need to unpack the term. What is What do you mean by dig uh, du digital due process? Because part of it is liability for the companies, for the content which is illegal. And for that, we have certain consensus, at least on the European level, uh, on around the EU directive, e-commerce directive, and also, there is also ABMS directive for the media, uh, audiovisual media services, although that's now being revised. I mean, uh, audiovisual service, media directive services was revised and e-commerce is now under the review. But the second one is, and it's not uniformly recognized around the world because a lot of countries do have a, a liability for the content regardless of this, uh, these rules, uh, which are set in the EU. And the second one is what is the process for the company's compliance under their terms of service? Because what is under the terms of service can be, you know, legal, but harmful and a company can decide to remove it for certain reasons, right? So for that, we need a clarity as well. And that's why the institutions such as the social media councils, which could be set up on the example, if they are on a local level, they can be similar to like anti-corruption companies, or sorry, anti-corruption authorities or privacy companies. 
uh, sorry, privacy regulators that are individually on each country and then they cooperate on the you know, regional or European level. So we can develop these mechanisms and processes that would um, push for greater clarity and consistency across the globe. Thanks, Barbara. More questions? Um, this lady at the back there in the, in the black. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Claire Jarvis from the FCO. Um, I have a, a, an observation that's linked to the previous one, um, which is that in, in circumstances where a lot of the disinformation threats are coming from abroad, you can't really solve this pro problem without also addressing the question of jurisdiction and the ability of states to both prescribe their laws extraterritorially and then to enforce those laws. Um, and traditionally, the recognized basis for the exercise of extraterritorial jurisdiction are tied to uh, the state's territory or the state's um, nationals, and they're not really equipped to deal with um, issues that uh, relate to the internet and, and transcend borders. Um, but I had a second um, observation which relates to uh, your recommendation that one of the solutions is to get um, states to treat data as an asset with a commercial benefit that would be shared with the data uh, subjects. Um, but it seems to me that we're in this mess because data has been commodified. Um, and I wonder if actually real change will only come with uh, when society starts to come to terms with the idea that they might have to pay for access to some of these online services, which itself has implications, of course, for democracy. Yeah, another good question. Kate, did you want to? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, yeah, I think we'll just do that one first and then I'll move to a few in, in a minute because we've probably got you know, okay. 35 minutes yeah. or so. So yeah. I don't know if any of you want to comment on that, perhaps. Susie? Yeah, I mean, I think and it's raised in, in your report, mm. obviously, the problem of, of external interference in elections, particularly, which I think is part of what you're, you're talking about, about the, the activity coming from abroad. I mean, one of the things that I think would be very interesting, whether it's on a diplomatic level or on a sort of interstate complaint level, is if states start complaining uh, where they are saying that that interference is coming from another state. Whether or not that will ever happen, because I imagine that it's an issue uh, that you'd have to be fairly confident that you couldn't be accused of the same thing uh, somewhere else before doing that. But I think that there are opportunities to raise these questions internationally in terms of interstate questions using the human rights argument. Yeah. Yeah. On the state yeah. level, this is not a new topic. Whole OSC, Organization of Security and Cooperation on, on, um, in Europe, came from discussing on satellite jamming in the past. And they spent 20 years discussed to what, what, under what circumstances you should prohibit satellite jamming. And this was about the Radio Free Europe or Radio um, Voice of America uh, broadcasting to you know former Soviet countries. So if you prohibit it from you know international perspective, then you will stop uh, the Radio Free Bahrain or Persia, uh, and because Iran will also say that we should limit this because this is interference into our uh, domestic affairs or like supporting opposition and so on. So from the you know, geopolitical level, I think there will be very difficult to find the solutions to it, but the solutions to some of these issues might be through unauthentic behavior and what the platforms do with, in, the, in the realm of security of the platform, not from like national security, but what it is used for and how it is misused for the purposes which is not built for. And we need more clarity on those because there is zero information from the platforms what they do and how they are effective in the measures which they take. So they would sometimes announce like we stop 20,000 bots, but that would be, a lot of them would be, you know, normal users who would be just marked according to Facebook or Twitter algorithm that they are bots. So that's uh, also an issue. So we need to build a safety and a safeguards for freedom of expression if we go for these solutions. Thank you. Um, I think we'll go to this side of the room. Um, gentleman in the middle there. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name's Alex Folks. I work as an election observer for OSCE, amongst other people. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the paper, Kate. Uh, I think it's an excellent read. Um, I, apologies for following on from the questions that have already been asked. Um, when it comes to the law, as Kate has said in this paper, there are various countries which have opted for a different path. She's named uh, France, Germany, and Singapore. 
um, and those are radically different from perhaps the American approach, California notwithstanding. Um, when it comes to those laws, the countries have to abide by universal human rights. They may not do so perfectly, but they, uh, they, they should do so. When it comes to individual laws, my field is elections, but there are many others as well. Countries have very different sets of rules and regulations. You've talked about the global context of this. I'm wondering how you see in the, sh in the short to medium term the platforms that exist at the moment. Um, are they going to continue to try to provide a universal service working on universal uh, platform policies? Or do you think that they are going to be forced to comply with individual state laws, uh, individual nation state laws, um, whether it be elections or anything else, uh, so that they can keep their licenses and, and not, uh, not get shut down. Thanks, Alex. Um, Evelyn, did you have comments on that one? Right away? Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, at least, uh, so let me answer it this way. I'm a member of the Global Network Initiative, with a multi-stakeholder initiative of companies, academics, um, and others, um, NGOs, who um, encourage companies to react to all local laws by using you know, the international standard. And um, the ways to do that, because of course they must follow local law at the end of the day, but the way to do that is um, to interpret the laws narrowly, to challenge them in court. So something to watch for is, Will the platforms actively challenge the law in Singapore, um, which violates many human rights? Will they actively uh, challenge that in, in local courts? Um, so that's the approach you know, lots of civil society has been taken. But ultimately, yes, they do have to respect local law. Everyone acknowledges that, even these multi-stakeholder <coughs> initiatives that acknowledge that, even the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights acknowledge that. So that is the risk at the end of the day, that if the platforms do what they can but still can't change the local laws, that's what we have. And I would note that many of the laws you referenced, you know, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression has expressed very serious concerns with all, with all of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kate, do you want to come back? Um, yes, just briefly, and I, I agree very much with, with Evelyn. I think that's a really good question, and the points that Claire made are also two very good points. I think that um, the first thing is that there are a lot of parts of the world where um, or an increasing number of states where laws have been enacted which are clearly violating the right to freedom of expression in particular. Um, and so part of the international effort is to try to prevent that, to prevent, for example, laws that ban online falsehoods, because as Barbara said, that's not compatible with the right to freedom of expression. So um, part of, a large part of the international effort is focused on these very grave violations that we see. I think as regards to your question about compliance with laws, I think if platforms are so large that they are operating in all of these different states, then it is incumbent on them to comply with local laws as well as the law of where they are headquartered. And we should expect that of, of um, platforms. And not only that, but it doesn't only apply to law, but it also applies to cultures and to appreciating things in their cultural context. And we've already seen some uh, terrible events when platforms perhaps haven't been controlling speech or regulating speech in, in the knowledge of cultural context. And I think that's really important. And if you are going to be a large platform, you have to have the infrastructure in place in order to do that. Yeah. Just one more sure, on, thanks. On the election, since you said that you are from the observation mission of the OSCE, what we see also now in the crease is the memorandum of understanding or some sort of agreement between the dominant platforms and the electoral commissions before the elections. So for example, in India, Mexico, Colombia, I think Switzerland before the election, uh, and they have a referendum. So they would have an agreement, which are not transparent actually. We only got p access to part of what was agreed with um, the Facebook in Mexico. So this might be one of the issues to look into from election observation point of view. And there are issues such as how well they observe you know, silence period, or what would be the rules on uh, political advertising during the election. Uh, and this is especially in the areas where the users get most of the information from social media. So this is something to look into. But this is totally untransparent so far. Okay, thank you. I can see there are quite a few hands, so I'm going to start grouping the questions. Let's start at the very back there. Thank you. 
Hi, Pascal Crow. Um, I'm the Data and Democracy Project Officer at Open Rights Group. We're a digital rights campaigning organisation. Um, we've been running a project uh, using the right of data subject access um, to find out what uh, types of personal data political parties are holding on us. Mm -hmm. um, and the results have been kind of varied, but one of the, the kind of uh, lawful bases for processing that they often claim is uh, that processing our personal data in this manner is necessary for an activity that supports or promotes democratic engagement. Now, quickly, I just wondered if you had any preliminary thoughts on how we might start to unpick that claim legally. And also, on the flip side, you know, if there are any circumstances under which processing personal data in this way might actually be a good thing for democratic engagement, if it's just about maximizing turnout. Yeah, thinking about the flip side. Um, OK, I'll take a couple more questions Let's start on this side. Thank you. Um, my question goes to Professor Eswed because she's probably the most awake, given the time difference. <laughs> Did you so, name and affiliation? Oh, sorry, yes. Car Carla Kuwaiti from Big Innovation Centre. We had a fringe event in both political parties actually exactly on this, and we called it the Fake Times Society Politics and You. <laughs> so um, my question is, uh, while Facebook, obviously, as you rightfully mentioned, um, you rightly mentioned, they do employ in-house uh, lawyers and, and other experts. But obviously, in-house means that these people will work for them and not for the benefit of society 100% and impartially. Could government do the same thing and start hiring people who used to be in-house in Facebook techies? Because the Department of Trade, for example, they do hire people from various sectors who used to be in-house in, in their corresponding sectors. Uh, as we have seen, obviously, Mark Zuckerberg was very cautioned in that hearing um, in, in DC by the lack of knowledge and education of policymakers. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take one more from this side. The gentleman there. Thank you. David Nordell. I'm a cybersecurity consultant. Um, Kate alluded to one of the situations which is actually the, the, the most egregious uh, offense against human rights in this context, and that's the People's Republic of China. Um, four years ago, I heard with my own ears President Xi talking about how the laws need to be changed and interpreted in, uh, ostensibly in order to protect a public order and safety and so on and so on, morality, but actually this was all about uh, restricting access to information uh, by restricting the internet. So this is a country which simply doesn't take human rights seriously in the first place, at least as far as we understand them in the West. A second egregious example of abuse is India, where there's a bottom-up technical abuse using the platform called Telegram, where there are tens, possibly hundreds of millions of users who are being fed, in many cases, fake news in order to influence their political behavior. It's not a question of collecting information on them, but basically using this platform as a propaganda platform in order to tell people lies that will then make them support a particular party or particular candidate or oppose them. And I don't see that the Indian government is even capable of dealing with this problem because it's basically something that you can't censor unless you simply switch off national access, something that China, of course, does when you're talking about most of the, the Western uh, social media platforms. The third egregious example is, of course, Russian involvement in the last US election, which I haven't heard anyone talking about. I don't believe that the Russians were particularly supporting Trump or Hillary Clinton. I think that what they're trying to do is to create as much confusion as possible in order to damage the political system in the United States and damage a national belief in democracy. But it's an egregious example of cyber dis disinformation that affected elections. So how do you see these problems? Thank you. So three quite different questions about the types of personal data parties they're holding, whether government should hire techies, and egregious examples. Um, Susie, should I start with you? Have you got any comments on those? Um, only really on the first question, um, which I'd be very interested in discussing further. Um, 
I think the question to ask is what exactly, how exactly they're using profiling and targeting of individuals, you know, what the purpose of it is. Is it just to get the vote out campaign, which I'm fairly sure it's not. Um, and I think it's very interesting that, you know, last year there was a call from the advertising industry, um, the IPA, calling for a moratorium on political advert micro-targeting, um, which obviously hasn't been followed. And I think that's a big question, is, is, is what the potential impact of this micro-targeting is. So, yes, that is always the, the argument and the justification for the political party's exemption is that their job is to engage with people and with people's political opinions. But I think it's really important to just ask how exactly they're doing that and start looking at what, you know, how they think they are shifting people's opinions. Kate. Yes. Um, on the first question, great that you're doing this research, I think, and making these subject access requests to really um, get into what, what's happening here. Um, and as regards the justification of political engagement, which I see too in, in the uh, political party's policy that I have in front of me, I think it is an interesting one, just as the other justifications on which data is collected and used are also interesting. Consent, as I say, this sort of notional consent that we are all giving all the time. Uh, is this still really consent? And if not, where do we take that? Um, and the legitimate interest spaces for consent, which is also used for many things. Um, I don't particularly have insights to offer on it at this minute, but I think it's fantastic that you're doing the research and we need to have a conversation about where the boundaries of these ought to be, while at the same time enabling society to continue to, to operate fluidly. Um, as regards knowledge of policymakers, um, yes, I think something that came out of my research right across the piece is that it's really difficult for people who are outside the technology companies to actually know what's going on because technology is evolving so rapidly and behind closed doors that for any of us it's very difficult to find this out. There's absolutely fantastic research that's done by academics and so on but the clearest explanations that we've had have been from people who've worked in tech companies and then have left, whether that's Brittany Kaiser on Cambridge Analytica, um, whether that's James Williams, who used mm. to be at Google, and Tristan Harris, a couple of other people like that who have come out and have talked about these things. Um, and I think we need a lot more transparency in order to think about the public interest. And having that transparency would be in the interest of the platforms as well, because some of the platforms are genuinely trying to do what, what they can in order to safeguard the public interest and to do these balancing exercises. But as I say, the duty shouldn't really lie with them primarily to work out what the public interest is. The duty should lie with governments to decide how to do it. But in order to do that, they need to see uh, what's going on and see what the issues are. Um, and that applies particularly perhaps to the techniques that Susie and I have been talking about and freedom of thought and opinion, which can almost sound a bit like scaremongering. But then when you start to read the tech reports from people who know about this stuff, you start to realize how insidious it actually is. And, and we could go into, there are some examples in my report, but yeah. Um, on the third question, um, I don't particularly want to discuss specific countries, although the example of the um, Russia and IRA interference in the US election is talked about quite a bit in the paper. Um, but again, I think transparency is, is very important. But the second thing is, that again, structures are important. We don't necessarily have to accept the structures that we have and then think about how we tinker in order to, um, in order to make them compatible with human rights law. We should be thinking about human rights in the design of those structures as well. So again, pointing to, if need be, a more sort of radical reconceptualization, mm -hmm. something controversial to put out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Evelyn, Barbara, do feel free to respond on those questions quite briefly if you may, so we can get around to more questions as well. Oh, just one example, we asked whether the government should employ this uh, people with technical knowledge and actually a very good example is the French government uh, when they were coming up with the proposal on how to regulate the online harms, like their version of online harms paper, they actually had agreement with Facebook and they had a team of French uh, public servants, judges, big team to in, be embedded in Facebook for three months and then they came with a proposal following this three months stint uh, with Facebook and their proposal is actually far more superior to the 
uh, to the British one, which is very confusing and also not understanding the ecosystem of the online uh, online players. So that's a good example of how to do the public policy based on understanding of the limitations of those platforms. Yeah, um, and I'll uh, react to that question too. Um, just preliminarily, I wanted to say, I do think that companies need to be hiring more international human rights experts. What they've done is, is not sufficient to really mainstream this topic through their companies. And they should be also sharing with us how they are mainstreaming human rights assessments, and they should be making public their interpretation of human rights law. As someone who worked for the old governors, right, the US government, big part of my job was explaining and defending how our government interpreted uh, human rights standards. So all this is still, we don't understand how it's happening in the companies. Um, that said, with regard to the question of should the US government be hiring more of the, the tech experts, um, I, I would say yes, but I'm not optimistic that that will happen because the flow is completely happening the other way now. So many of my former colleagues from State Department, I see them at conferences, I ask them how state, they're like, oh, I'm now at Facebook, I'm now at Apple. Um, and I do think that's good that they're having people who have international experience and understand international instruments coming into those companies. Um, they also, Facebook hired as their general counsel the former head of the legal advisor's office at the State Department, right? So it is really going in one direction right now, and I'm happy that tech companies are getting that expertise, but I think it's gonna be very hard Hard, especially competing with salaries to have a US government salary versus a Silicon Valley uh, salary. So there may need to be ways to kind of think about improving incentives and bringing expertise. Now there's a lot of people with a lot of passion in the, the civil society who, um, as we have been mentioning, have been bringing their tech background and that's been very helpful. But probably even more incentivizing of that would be very important. Thank you for the question. Thank you. So we'll have another round of questions. Um, the lady in white here. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Marjolein Bustrup from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I'm doubting whether I'm making a purely intellectual point here, but the thing I'm often missing in this debate about human rights and, and uh, elections or tech companies is the fact that human rights are um, imposed duties on states mostly and not on companies and companies have a responsibility but it's always the states that have the human rights duty for instance and, and i think that's relevant when you talk about freedom of thought yes it's absolute but it's absolute when you talk about the state's duty to respect that and when you talk about companies it's a whole different story because it goes through what the state should do so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that because I think sometimes it's conflated for instance in David Kay's reports he hardly makes that distinction and that can confuse people thinking oh the companies have to um, apply the same standard as governments and it's not the case mm -hmm. thank you I'm sure Evelyn will have something to say on that but um, I'm going to take a couple more before we get back on that um, the lady over here thank you Hi, I'm Gabriela. Um, I work in the industry. I'm a marketeer. I was thinking a million times before if I should ask or not. So um, completing like, his uh, uh, question, uh, when I moved to the UK, I worked in the biggest FMCG company in, in the world. And digital uh, was our main tool. And he used to use an agency, the same agency we are clients, or the same uh, conducting elections, uh, having one of the client, their clients were a um, candidate. So with that in mind, I went to Oxford for uh, uh, two foundations of diplomacy and to try to fill this gap. And I said, what could I do working for the industry to fill this gap between them? And I think the gap became bigger. And one of the things I have in my mind is it's very black and white and nowadays. So the states or regulators uh, have something in mind going towards the platforms, but it's missing this uh, other stakeholders, for example, the agencies, the advertising agencies. So how we bring them to the game, to the talk, and also uh, the different type of generations. So for example, the type I see b online in banking is completely different from my grandfather, and we have different views. So we have uh, both different views of through elections and how our data is being uh, so, I would say. So, how could the state and regulators compromise, and how the industry as well could compromise and we meet halfway uh, on top of hiring people from both sides? Thank mm. you. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. And we'll take one more um, over here. Thank you. 
Um, Paddy Cochler from <coughs> Oxford University. Um, question for Professor Aswood. You tantalizingly said that you had views on the Facebook Oversight Board and you might be persuaded to uh, elaborate. Can you please? <laughs> very good question. Very good. Very relevant to today's topic. So um, maybe we'll start with uh, Susie, would you like to speak? Yeah, I mean, in, in response to the question about states' obligations, I mean, states have an obligation to protect us from third parties. And that's where I think it's very important. And that's why a lot of the discussion is around regulation. And precisely, uh, we've discussed how, <laughs> and the report also um, turns on the fact that we can't just expect industry to decide its own standards. States need to decide where the lines are that they need to put down in order to protect their population's rights. Um, and I think when you're talking about elections, that's then particularly important because it's about how the whole state functions uh, and the, the sort of future impact on our rights of, of eroding democracy, if you like. There's, a, there's an important duty to protect the, the very fundamentals of democracy, which I think what the report is highlighting are those really fundamental uh, threats. So I think that's where it's not about saying precisely that the businesses need to be um, complying with human rights in a vacuum. It's about saying that states and international organizations need to put clearer boundaries on what businesses are allowed to do. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Kate. No, I agree. Yes. Yeah. Now, Evelyn, a couple of questions are specifically directed to you. Okay, we'll say Barbara. To, to the Dutch delegation, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you make a very, very good point, and we always highlight this in, um, in our interventions that actually the companies, we need to accept that the companies can introduce much lower standard than what is in the international, international law. So under international law, it's not you know, illegal to say profanities, but Facebook can, or Twitter, they can introduce a rule that no profanities on our platform, and they indeed do. But then the problem is consistency and uh, transparency of these decisions, because what we see is that they actually don't make consistent decisions, even on the issues such as like, you know, hate speech or, you know, political figures, right? Under international standards, you have, as a politician, you need to suffer higher level of intrusion than ordinary citizens. However, under their standards, it's less. So they would take, uh, they would refuse to take down the threats towards female journalists. But if somebody says, I'm going to kill Trump, although the likelihood of somebody killing Trump from like, Malaysia uh, is zero, they would remove that content, right? So that's problematic from the consistency of the application of their community guidelines. And then the second one is that the states are actually failing to, to um, consider this in their liability regulations. So it is a problem from both sides. Thank you. Evelyn. OK. Um, yeah, so looking at the, the question of uh, Facebook's oversight board and um, why I have some uh, cause for optimism in terms of it potentially being a vehicle to bring in international human rights law, uh, there's really three reasons I have um, this optimism, and all of them regard documents that were issued in September by Facebook. First, they issued an um, update to their community standards and values that said they would be looking and guided by international human rights law and some of their content moderation standards. So that, um, that was a useful hook within the community <coughs> standards and within their values to, to begin having a reason to look at human rights uh, standards, international human rights standards. Uh, then when the charter was released, Mark Zuckerberg issued simultaneously uh, a letter to the international community. And in that letter, he said Facebook would be engaging in content moderation um, and looking for guidance in international human rights standards. So in what was a fairly short letter in a very high profile uh, initiative by the company, the fact that he dedicated a sentence to mentioning international human rights standards, I thought, was significant. Um, the charter itself, which is the constitution uh, guiding the board's activities, um, has in Article 2 a provision that says the board is to pay particular attention to the impact of removing content in light of human rights norms protecting free expression. So that is, again, another link to human rights norms. 
Now, um, I have guarded optimism <laughs> because you know the board members have not been appointed yet. We haven't seen any opinions issued. Um, as I was saying previously, we don't know what internal guidance uh, Facebook is using in terms of um, Mark Zuckerberg's statement that they will be engaging in content moderation with guidance from international human rights standards. So there's a lot of ifs, including the fact that the board's docket will be fairly limited, right? For over two and a half billion plus users, the board will be hearing a very small number of cases. So we will see how influential um, their opinions will be beyond the actual uh, parties involved in those cases. So that's kind of a space to, to watch out for and see what happens. But there are some causes for optimism. They also mm. said yeah. that it might not be binding decisions and they might refuse to implement them if it's not in the business interest of Facebook. So they have said no. they will implement the, for that uh -huh. particular dispute, they will implement yeah. it, but they will only consider the larger theme depending on their business needs, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So that also potentially limits the impact of the decisions. Though for the in exact decision, they would implement the, the content decision. Um, if I could also yeah, res uh, respond a little bit to the question from the uh, Dutch Foreign Ministry. Um, you know, the way I think about it is um, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, they call on companies to respect these international human rights standards even if the country they're operating in hasn't signed up to those standards and violates those standards. So if a platform is operating in a country that has a law that says you cannot criticize the ruling regime, right, the company is supposed to realize, oh yes, that violates international free speech standards and we should resist to the extent possible, right? We need to have an action plan to avoid infringing on rights and we need to provide remedies um, when infringements happen. If they're operating in a country that doesn't have that type of limitation, but they impose that law in their own um, platform law, in their own content moderation rules, say they say, you know, this is a big hassle, we're upsetting governments around the world, we want rules that just say you can't ever criticize the government, that too would infringe um, human rights and they should avoid having rules that um, would say something like that. So to me, they really are looking at the same standard to assess is the national law okay under international human rights law? And is our content moderation okay or not? Um, and one of the um, arguments the special rapporteur has given the companies is, you know, you are holding countries to this international standard. That would be more persuasive if you hold yourself to that standard too. Because right now you're saying, hey, you know, country X don't have these bad laws, but we certainly can do that for 2.5 billion users. So I think that's a very powerful argument that they apply the same laws, uh, the same international human rights law to a local ordinance or law as they do to their content rules. Thanks, Jasmin. Kate, did you want to address the question there over here? Yes, I think the other two questions have both been really well addressed. But just to say, I think the point that you raise is a really good one. Um, we know that a lot of the techniques that digital platforms use um, and others as well originated from the advertising industry and the techniques that they had developed over the years. Um, so I think bringing advertising into the conversation about what we're doing and where the boundaries of legit legitimacy are is, um, is a really important thing to do. Um, and because seven o'clock's coming up, just to, perhaps if I could make a, a, a very final point, obviously um, in the UK we've got the general election coming up. Mm -hmm. um, we have essentially the same rules that we had in 2017. Um, we've had some really significant changes by platforms, I think, in terms of their algorithms and in terms of uh, advertising libraries or, or um, uh, bans on, on adverts. But I think what I'm beginning to notice already in this election campaign is actually the value of responsible journalism in this field as well. And that's maybe something that hasn't come up yet this mm -hmm. evening. There have been some really fantastic articles sort of uh, debunking myths or trying to show uh, where things are wrong or where fake news is, is going around. Um, and I think that that is going to play a really, that responsible journalism is more vital than ever and is going to play a really important part in this election. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. That's a semi-positive note on which to end. Um, I, I know that some of you had questions um, and I'm sorry that our time is up, but I hope you'll join us upstairs shortly and we can continue the conversation. I'd just like to, to sort of summarize um, very briefly which really I think is that today and tonight has shown us, I hope, the value of international human rights law in the context of cyber disinformation in elections, and perhaps also the complexity and challenges of applying it as well.
but certainly that when we're talking about regulatory remedies, for example, transparency or accountability, the international human rights law framework, which has existed for decades and is supported by uh, case law and treaties and so many recommendations and um, the opinions of special rapporteurs, it's already there. It's a, it's a huge body that can be drawn upon and should be arguably taken into much greater account when we're talking about issues like transparency and accountability that are, are part of the international human rights dialogue and have been for a long time. Um, and I hope that those lessons will be drawn not only in terms of the substance of how one looks at um, things like online content and actually applying the law in, in substantive terms, but also, as we've heard, the value of international human rights law in process in terms of how uh, those digital platforms deal with their users and what the users are entitled to see and to complain about and the processes that go around that as well. So thank you very much for your insightful questions. Um, I'd be very grateful if you could join me in thanking our excellent panel tonight.